How are you all doing this morning? It's good to see you. Hey, my voice went completely out on me yesterday. I'll warn you ahead of time. I, had, I was pretty, uh, just a bad cold kind of under the weather. So I've been doing some elbows, kind of hid back there this morning because I didn't want to get anybody sick. But um, hey, I just want to update y'all. If you were here, if you were here last week at the end of service, uh, we had to keep everybody inside. We were notified by the police something had happened, so we didn't let anybody out. And and I just I, I got an update this week that was sent to me. So I just wanted to kind of give you the full picture, the rest of the story. Um, so basically, the police were surrounded. They were called in surrounding Living Faith Church. And then they cordoned off some residential streets in that area. And what had happened, it was a domestic violence issue, and the husband had threatened the wife. Uh, And luckily, now the husband is in custody. But, um, you know, the way God works, we had just had a a guy, a professional come in here, Nate Avishine, and do training with our team. And I just look at God's providence with that because our security was all over that. They did a great job. They had eyes out. We were getting texts from uh, someone that we know who's a police officer, so we knew it was happening in the area. And we wanted to keep everybody safe, and everybody was safe. So I'm grateful for those that week after week uh, serve in security. And uh, again... Without, without repeating myself, we do have cameras all over the premises. We monitor them remotely. We have a whole team in place. And so uh, we just want to uh, really give uh, thanks and honor to those folks. And uh, you know what? I will say this. I missed an opportunity last week. During that time when that was happening, that would have been a fantastic opportunity to pray for that situation. But to be fully transparent, I was 100% jet lagged. And I was just glad I got through my sermon in one piece. But let's do this. Let's pray for that family right now, okay? So, Father, we lift up that family. Um, Lord, we would assume that the wife is a believer since she was at church. Lord, we don't know the details, but you do. God, we lift up that husband. We lift up that, that family, that situation. Would you intervene? Lord, would you bring life? Would you bring healing? Lord, we ask that you bring health to that man no matter what he's going through. Lord, protect that family. Protect that wife. Protect, if they do have kids, protect them. Would you put a very real shield of protection around them? Put them in your strong tower. Keep them safe, Lord. Let, let your hand deal with that situation as exactly as it needs to be dealt with. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, forgive me for not praying last week. That's what I should have done. When someone mentioned it to me on Monday, I was like, you're absolutely right. I should have prayed. My brain was kind of checked out. But hey, uh, I just want to say something. We were doing a campaign at the end of the year to replenish our our savings. We spent $68,000 last year in repairs. We have a beautiful campus, but it is aging. And we did a refill the house campaign push. And the final number I want to celebrate with you is $15,000. Three hundred and fifty-nine dollars, and hey, I'm so grateful because let's get real. It's not as exciting to give to a savings account. It's much more exciting to give to like a building campaign or a missions trip. But the reality is this: we've been given this beautiful piece of property, this beautiful campus to steward, and it's aging. So it's going to take finances if the AC unit goes out. So I am incredibly grateful for your generosity, and uh, that's something to celebrate because it's really, really cool to see. And, you know, I actually had an intro to this sermon, and I scrapped the entire front page, copy and paste onto another page, because I had a testimony happen this week uh, that I want to share with you. I don't know if it exactly ties in, but it made me think of of last week in in our text in James. We had the scripture that is from James 1.17 that says this, every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like the shifting shadows. And I just shared with us that God is good all the time. And I kind of had a reminder and a taste of the goodness of God this week, and let me share uh, what happened. So a few weeks ago, our church offices were broken into, and between Taylor and I, uh, with our personal instruments, we lost around $5,000 worth of instruments. Taylor had two guitars and a bass guitar stolen, and I had an acoustic guitar stolen. Now, the deal with my acoustic is this, um, it's irreplaceable, meaning that company is no longer in business. And if you know guitars, let me just set it up for you. It's American-made, handmade, crafted in America, American wood, a brand called Tacoma, out of their custom shop. There's not another guitar like that that exists. Um, and so I had bought it from a friend of mine years ago, and, and even finding anything out on the internet to try to give the police 
details was very difficult. So we contacted our church insurance, and what they told us is, first, before we cover you, what we need you to do, since this is your personal property, both of you need to contact your homeowner's insurance, which makes sense, private property. So I called up my homeowner's insurance, which I've never made a claim in before, and I called up the lady and talked to her and just explained to her, said, hey, you know, we're at a church and our instruments got stolen, and she said, oh, that's terrible. And I said, you know, it, it happens, but... Uh, we started talking. She's, you know, my, my father plays guitar for years and he owns so many different instruments. And I said, that's great. And she goes, you get attached to him, don't you? I said, that instrument, and I explained to her what I just explained to you. It's irreplaceable. It's a one of a kind. You can't replace it. I said, it's handmade, American made. Uh, but I did find the exact price of that. I found an advertisement and I told her, I said, this guitar new is anywhere from $12,050, some $12,000, excuse me, I wish, $1,250 to around $1,350. So anywhere from $1,250 to $1,300 would have been a new price. I paid not that much for it. I paid around $800 bucks for it, seven to $800 for it. And so I gave her that information very honestly and told her all about the guitar. And she's just like, oh, I can't believe that happened. And she says, well, give me a second. And she puts me on hold for three minutes and then comes back and says, well, Mr. Goodwin, I got good news. It looks like we'll be able to help you out. But, and then I interrupted her. I said, but I have a deductible. She said, yes, sir. Your deductible is $1,000. So do the math with me real quick. If the guitar brand new is $1,250 and my deductible is $1,000, best case scenario, how much money am I getting back? $250. So I sit there, and I, I'm not really surprised. I'm thinking the church insurance will cover the deficit, hopefully. By the way, let me pause that. There's a ministry in count, town called J17, and Taylor had put up Facebook posts that got shared many times about our, with pictures of our instruments, and J17 saw the post and sent us a check for $1,000 just to bless us, like boom. I came back from uh, being out of town and they gave us a check for $1,000 and that's amazing, by the way. Anyway, she's offline for like 15 minutes. She says, we have our own database, I'll do the research. And after 15 minutes, she comes back and I'm waiting for my $200, $250 check. And she comes back, she says, sir, I I've done some comparisons and the equivalent guitar to the one that you had would be a guitar that cost around $2,600. And with tax on top of that, would you be okay if we cut you a check for $1,933? And I was like, are you serious? I literally, I, I, I listened to her for a second. I said, ma'am, are you talking about the deductible? She's like, no, that's with the deductible subtracted. Would you be okay if we give you a check for $1,933? I said, I'm totally okay with that. And, it, and here's a crazy thing. It was deposited in less than 24 hours in my account, in my checking account the next day. So God is good. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. And that, this week, I, I think I talked to Brenda Hanna uh, immediately after that happened. I was really excited telling everybody I could because that was just the goodness of God. God reminding us that truly every good and perfect gift comes from him. And, and this week, as we, we jump into the last bit of scriptures in chapter one, we're going to find ourselves in this incredibly challenging passages. And as I've shared with you for years, this passage um, for me is incredibly convicting because it highlights an issue in my life that I've struggled with for years and years and years. And, and one way that I choose to preach, it's very intentional it's not haphazard, is I choose to preach as someone who is walking out the faith with you. I don't preach from an ivory tower like I have everything together. I don't always give all of my illustrations like it's something in the past. I am literally called to shepherd and help lead uh, this flock, but I am truly in the trenches walking with Jesus with you. And this week, we're gonna highlight an issue in my own life that has been something that's been absolutely pivotal so let's go ahead and dive back in to James chapter 1. We're going to read verses 19 and 20. And let's start there. Here's what he says. You guys got your Bibles this week? All right. Here's what he says, starting in verse 19 through 20. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. So everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness 
that God desires. And I love how this verse starts out because you can easily just kind of overlook this statement. But he says this, my brothers and sisters, take note of this. So it's James making an emphasized point. He's saying, listen, pay attention to what I'm about to share because this is significant. This is important. And then he transitions into this. He says, you be quick and slow and slow. Can you say that with me? Say quick, slow, and slow. One more time. Quick, slow, and slow. He says, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And my first thought when I heard that was, again, the cliche that maybe a lot of us have heard. You know, there's actually a reason why God has given us two ears and one mouth. I think there's a very intentional ratio to that. Two ears because we are to be be quick to listen and then slow to speak. But I think oftentimes, I know for me, uh, God has worked in my life for years and years and years, and I'm still in development of learning how to listen even better and more intentionally. But I think oftentimes the reason we don't do that is because our default nature, apart from being transformed and redeemed in Jesus, is to be self-centered and not other-centered. Did you get that? In your listening to others, oftentimes the reason we're so quick to want to jump in and make sure that we have a voice and that we are heard is because we're often, we're often self-centered instead of being other centered. And I love what the NIV Life Application Study Bible, the note on this verse, what it said. I'm going to read it to you. It said this. It says, we talk too much and listen too little. We communicate to others that we think our ideas are more important than theirs. And James wisely advises us to reverse this process. Put a mental stopwatch on your conversations and keep track of how much you talk and how much you listen. When people talk to you, do they feel like their viewpoints and ideas have value? Or when they talk to you, are you just waiting for them to take a breath so you can jump in and make sure that your voice gets heard? You know, we have phones and we have all these different apps on our phone. I wonder if we have an app that could track the ratio of how much we speak to how much we listen. I wonder what our ratio would be. You thought about that? I mean, our phones are already listening to us, right? Funny slash not funny. True. Our phones are already listening to us, so that's my theory at least, because I'll talk about something and all of a sudden, wow, that's amazing. There's an advertisement for that exact thing. I wonder if we had an app that could track the ratio to how much we listen to how much we speak. What, you know, what would our ratio be every week? If we could, if we could look at that and go, oh my gosh, I was talking like 90% of the time. I barely listened to anybody. You know, I wonder what that ratio would be for each of us, but, you know, it makes me think about uh, what I heard a guy who teaches on evangelism to the younger generation, what he says. He says, listen, one of the most important things you could do for the younger generations is listen to them. They want to be heard. And so oftentimes we feel this need to kind of force our truth and force our opinions or force what we want to say upon them. And truly, there's a place for that. I'm not going to say there's never a place for that. Of course there is. But oftentimes with this younger generation, when they are heard, you know what they equate that to? They equate that to being loved. And so when you listen to them and you just give them a a platform to be heard and you do that over time, you know what happens? You build a relationship. And in that relationship, then you can build trust. And then from a place of trust, you will find windows and doors of opportunity to be open to then share the good news of Jesus with them. And I think it's so important that we as Christians, especially in a society that is now uh, stereotyping and, and typecasting how Christians actually are. We have a reputation in the world, and it's not always good. It's not always warranted, by the way. There is some ungodly judgment there. But oftentimes, we need to be characterized as people who are going to be listening and building those bridges of communication. So we need to be quick to listen. Now, I don't often associate the word quick or rapid, uh, you know, with, with listening, but that's what the Word of God says. It says, listen, if you're going to be quick to do anything, Be quick to listen. That means you have to close this thing and open both of these things. And you can do active listening. I don't know if you know, you can actually study and do research on the internet about how to listen better. Ask clarifying questions. 
mirror back to people what they just said and say, hey, what I heard you say is this. Is that actually what you said? It's called active listening. And there's a way to actually grow and develop in this area of listening. But then he says this, quick to listen, slow to speak, and then slow to get angry. Slow to speak and slow to get angry. And it seems like oftentimes if we're very quick to speak, not too far behind that, we can be quick to get angry. And I've shared this from, from the pulpit before, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty open about it. Um, I believe for years the Lord would not allow me to enter into full-time vocational ministry until the stronghold of anger was broken in my life. Now hear what I said, the stronghold of anger. Um, it doesn't mean that I don't ever struggle. It doesn't mean I don't have moments. I do. But there was a, there was a stronghold of my life that it seemed like at any minute, in, in certain situations when it got heated, I could just lose my cool, say things I regret, kind of go off the cuff. I could be quick to get angry. And, and I believe with all my heart, it was years and years of pursuing God and asking God to deal with that thing. I believe that that thing had to be dealt with before God would open up the doors of opportunity that he eventually did. <clears throat> but I thought of an illustration this week about what happens when we're quick to speak and quick to get angry. And I wrestled with this whole idea of this illustration. I, have, I actually have a prop, okay, a physical prop that I'm going to pull out. And I thought, this is either going to be a phenomenal prop that they'll never forget, or this is the worst idea I've ever had in my life. It's one of the two. I don't know if there's any middle ground, but I want you guys to say something. Say this, fake, fake, not real. This is fake. This is not real. Are you ready for my illustration? Okay, hold on to your seats. When we are quick to speak and quick to get angry, it's like we pull out a grenade. No, this is fake. This is not real. This is not a real grenade even though it looks real. And when we're not dealing with this thing in my life, when we just want to spout off at the mouth the first chance we get without checking our words, without checking with the Lord, when we just want to react and get angry, some of you all laughing, it's making me laugh right now. I actually did ask one female, because I asked all the guys, they're like, oh, that's a great illustration, do it. And I was like, I need to ask a female. So I did ask a female. But when we get, when we get angry, when we're quick to get angry, we just blow things up. You know that? When we just choose to react and respond and fly off the cuff, we just blow things up. It's like we just pull this out, pull out the pin, chunk it up in the air, and we'll see what happens. And if we're honest with ourselves and we look back at our lives, we can take an evaluation. And, and I don't know about you, but have you ever lost your cool, started running your mouth, and you say things that you regret tremendously? Maybe you've blown up friendships. Maybe you've blown up a job. Maybe you've blown up opportunities. Maybe you've hurt someone tremendously. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe you've, you've damaged someone so deeply that it took years and years and years to repair that. And see, when we're quick to get angry, it's like we just pull the pin out of a grenade and chunk it up in the air. That's why James is saying this. Is, it says, listen, it says that you should not be quick to get angry. You should slow to anger. And there's a principle I learned years ago. It's a simple, simple principle. And the principle is this. We need to learn how to respond instead of react. Did you catch that? That's not profound. That's simple. But it works. <clears throat> That's been one of the tools that God gave me <clears throat> This will be an interesting sermon. Let me stand back a little bit. I am closing my mouth when I cough. I was at the airport. This is random. I was at the airport, and there's a lady walking towards me, projectile coughing without covering her mouth, like coughing right at me. And I was like, seriously, post-COVID, that's what you're doing right now? Sorry, that was so random. It just popped in my head, and I was like, that's not cool. Stop it. I don't want to do that to you. So here we go. But we need to choose to learn how to respond instead of react. And listen, one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is what? It's self-control. It really is. And, and I think for years I looked at this issue of anger in my life as a real deep, super spiritual issue. It was, to some extent. But a lot of the practical tools that God has given me to navigate that is oftentimes I, I have a barometer and I know when I'm getting angry. I know when the anger's starting to come up. 
And, and there's a time where I've just learned some of the best wisdom you can have in a moment when you just want to speak immediately and when you want to get angry is this, shut your mouth. Shut your mouth and honor God. Now, hey, I still have my moments. I'm not going to act like I got this thing totally wired down, but I will say this. There's often times where I've actually told people, hey, I know we're in this conversation. I'm going to pause it right now because I can feel myself getting angry. I've actually said that before. I can feel myself getting angry, and, and I'd rather not say anything I regret. So I'm going to ask that we cease this conversation right now, and let's pick it up at a later time. And I can't tell, I haven't done that a lot. I've maybe done that four or five times in the last couple of years. But every time I've done that, I've really, really, really been glad that I did. Because you're just simply being authentic. You're being real. And listen, it doesn't say anger is a sin. It says getting angry quickly and easily and the reacting in a way that's ungodly is a sin. Anger is not a sin. You know, it says human anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. But there is such a thing as godly anger. Listen, you can read the scriptures. Jesus sat down and intentionally fashioned a whip to drive out the money changers in the temple. Jesus got angry. He would just go all in on the scribes and Pharisees. There is such a thing as righteous anger. <coughs> and we, we can get angry at abuse and injustice and we can get angry at sin that hurts other people, at abuse. That, that's something we should get angry of. In fact, we should not tolerate abuse in the church. And, and the church's reputation in the last many years has been greatly tarnished due to sexual scandals and sexual abuse that's been covered up and not brought to the light. It's greatly damaging to the reputation of Christ's followers and followers of Jesus. And that should make you angry. Makes me angry. Should be no place to tolerate that among the body of Christ. So there is a place for God's righteous anger. But what James is talking about here is our fleshly anger. Is that desire to respond without, without thinking through things, excuse me, that desire to react. And when you react, you're not thinking, right? You're going off pure emotion. Have any of you just got to the point where you were seeing red? You started redlining, you pulled out your bag of grenades, started pulling pins and throwing them up in the air, and you're like, I don't even care what happens right now. Listen, as soon as that thought enters your head, I'm so angry, I don't even care what happens right now, probably a good time to shut your mouth and exit stage right. Because probably what's going to follow it is not going to be godly, is not going to be honoring to Christ. Trust me, human anger, not checked, not kept in check by the Holy Spirit, does not bring about the righteous ways, the right ways that God has called us to live in. It does not honor him. And listen, if that's, there's actually workbooks you can go through. I know at a church I was at, they actually had a class on, on managing anger and learning how to get free of it. And again, there's actually practical steps you can take if that's a stronghold in your life to get free of that thing because, man, it just takes one moment, just takes one moment to ruin your witness. Just takes one harsh statement to blow up a relationship. It just takes one thing to damage someone so deeply it could take years to mend. So be on your guard. There's a reason why we need to be quick to listen to others. Slow to speak, measure your words, think about your words, and slow to get angry. Let's put, let's put the grenades away. For the sake of some of y'all, I can just tell how you thought about this illustration. I'm just gonna put it away completely. <laughs> Sorry about that. So moving on, but James does give us a way to actually respond to this. He does give us an appropriate call to action, an appropriate response. In James 1.21, this is what he says. He says, therefore, now every time there's a therefore, you got to wonder why it's therefore, right? What is it there for? He's, he's giving us a response after what he just told us about quick to listen, I'm quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. He says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you can save you. And that's the response. He has, he has two ways he wants us to respond. He wants us to get rid of something, and, and then he wants us to accept something. He says, get rid of all moral filth and, and evil that is prevalent. Now, keep in mind, James is writing this letter to Christ's followers. This letter is being written to the church. He, he's not saying this to the world. He's not telling the world to get rid of evil and moral filth. He's actually writing this to Christ's followers. 
He's saying, listen, in lieu of us needing to live a, a righteous life that God desires and to not get angry and to not speak too much, he says, one of the ways you can lean into that is get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. And, and, and he uses that word, it's so prevalent. But how do we get rid of this moral filth and evil that's so prevalent? Well, it goes back to a principle that should be a staple it should be a mainstay for those of us who are followers of Christ. It should be a habitual lifestyle for everyone who follows Jesus. And there's two things as we walk with Christ to get rid of all this moral filth and evil that is so prevalent among us. And it's this, it's confession and repentance. Confession and repentance. When is the last time you got with God? Or you found a safe brother and sister and you just confessed your sins? When's the last time you got real and just said, look, I'm dealing with something? Now, it needs to be the right person. It needs to be a safe person. It needs to be someone that will extend forgiveness and grace, but yet hold you accountable with God's truth. But when's the last time you confessed your sins to a brother or sister? If you've ever experienced that, I have many, 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 many times. If you've ever experienced that and then had someone pray with you afterwards and just pray that God would, would, would mend you and restore you, it's a powerful, powerful spiritual thing. Uh, one of my favorite scriptures, in fact, if you're a new believer or a seasoned believer, a mature believer, I, I believe it's a scripture all of us should have committed to memory. One that I mentioned last week in John 1, 9 says this, if we confess our sins... He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, Jesus promises this. If we confess our sins to him, he is faithful. He will not abandon you. He is just because of his sacrifice on the cross and he will forgive you of your sins and then listen to that last part, purify you, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. We often forget that part. But how do you get rid of this moral filth and this evil that's so prevalent, you ask God to cleanse you and purify you from all unrighteousness. You confess to a brother or sister, and sometimes you just need to get with God and confess to him. But, but I would say this. I would say it needs to be a very consistent lifestyle of us. For, for a, I don't want to put a time frame on it, but a minimum of once a week, a minimum of once a week, where you sit with God and just say, God, search my heart not out of condemnation, not out of legalism, but allowing the Spirit of God to illuminate an area of your life that needs his truth, that needs his grace, and needs his restoration. And then you lean into him and you ask him for forgiveness and you ask him for cleansing. So we're to get rid of all that stuff and then we're to accept what? We're to accept the word of God that is planted within us. Why? Because the word of God can save. See, we're to humbly accept the word of God and I would say, I love that language that says that it's planted within a seed. The word of God gets planted like a seed, but then we have the opportunity, whether we're going to co-labor and walk with God and allow that seed to germinate, we're going to bring God's rain on it, the sunshine on it, and allow it to grow deep roots in our life. See, James wants you to know that God's word is powerful. It has the power to save you. It has the power to deliver you. You have a problem with anger? You have a problem with speaking too much? Does your tongue constantly get you in trouble? Then God's word is powerful. It can deliver you and bring you into freedom. But you have to cultivate the word of God that's planted within you. You have to cultivate God's word in your light, allow it to germinate, allow it to take root. And, and another way that God's word takes root is found in this next set of scriptures. Let's read verses 23 through 24. Another way God's word takes root is this. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself, but do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now look at verse 22. Look at verse 22. The first thing that stands out to me in verse 22 is this. It says that we can deceive ourselves. We can be deceived. Do you know what the problem with deception is? It's deceiving. Profound. It's 
true. The problem with deception is deceiving. And the problem with deception is we don't know we're deceived because we're deceived. And it takes God's word to illuminate our lives to see where we have areas of deception. In fact, you'll see in these set of scriptures, he says this twice. And I don't think it's talked about often enough in the church. Again, this is not being written to the world. The world is deceived. Their eyes are blinded to see the true glory of Christ, the power of the gospel, till they come to faith. But this is being addressed to the church, saying, listen, believers, followers of Jesus, we can be deceived. And one way we're deceived is when we just simply listen to the word of God. We don't allow it to take root. We don't allow it to take action in our lives. Listen, the scribes and the Pharisees had more scripture committed to memory in their heart than we could ever imagine or dream or think. They knew the, the, their current Bible, the Old Testament in our eyes, backwards and forwards, but yet they could not recognize the Son of God standing in the flesh in front of them. That gives us an illustration that we can actually know, commit to memory, the word of God, yet not allow it to transform our lives, and we can deceive ourselves. Have you ever met anybody who is extremely religious, extremely judgmental, extremely critical, extremely harsh, and they knew the word of God maybe even way better than you did, but you never sensed the love and you never sensed the grace? See, you can be deceived where... You know the word, but you're not allowing it to take effect in your life. And listen, here's how I view ministry. When people say, are you in ministry or you do ministry and we have this ministry or that ministry, let me tell you what ministry is not. Ministry is not dry knowledge transfer. <clears throat> do you get that? Ministry is not you getting more information. That's not ministry. Now, that is an aspect of ministry, a small aspect of ministry, but that's not ministry. The goal of ministry is not for you to get more knowledge. The goal of a ministry is about your life being transformed to look more like Jesus. Amen. It's not to get more knowledge. It's to get more transformation in your life. A ministry is about Christ's transformation. It's about you becoming an authentic disciple that your life is being molded daily, weekly to look and become more like Jesus. And yes, that means that you do know the word. Yes, that means that your head is being filled with knowledge, but just dry knowledge without transformation is no good. It's no good. Again, the scribes and Pharisees warn us of that, that we can know the scriptures backwards and forwards. Hey, the enemy quotes scriptures. That's how he battled Jesus in the wilderness. You can quote scriptures and yet have your heart remain hard and totally unchanged. Brothers and sisters, this should not be. Should not be. We should have soft hearts. Our hearts should be soft with being ready to be soil that accepts the word of God, that God plants the seed and it is planted and it takes root and it's germinated and God brings his rain as it says in Hebrews chapter 11 and God brings his son to shine on our lives and he brings transformation. Other people look at us and they see Jesus coming out because we have become doers of the word. You know, I think oftentimes what's happened right now in, in American church cultures is, is you'll hear a lot of pastors talk about this is we've become a consumer-oriented Christian culture. We've become a, a church, I'm just I'm talking about the big C church nationwide, we've become a church of consumers. And because we have so many options, if you don't like my preaching, it's great. You can go to YouTube and there's like a million better preachers. Literally, you can listen to the, to the best of the best. You can go here to the best of the best worship. We have so many options. You can just church hop and go find your favorite place without committing and actually putting roots down. And that happens so often right now. We've become consumer oriented. And I think oftentimes we'll go listen to a message and we'll leave and go, yeah, it was a good message. It was great. Oh, it was a fantastic message. Or we'll leave and go, ah, it wasn't so good. His voice was going out. It seemed like he was sticking to his notes more. He had that stupid grenade illustration. I couldn't stand it. I can't believe he brought a grenade to church. I don't like that guy anymore. And oftentimes we're leaving and we're, we're rating the preacher and we're grading the pre preacher. But I wonder, let me give you a hypothetical scenario. I don't think it really happens, but it'd be interesting if it did. What if there was like a whole panel of angels with scorecards and you're leaving and you're like, yeah, the word was all right. I don't know. It was all right message. I don't know if I think about it. James isn't my favorite. And you're leaving and the angels are like, oh man, this guy gets an eight. 
really leaning into it. He got convicted about his anger. He's going to repent, really responding to the word. And then the other person left, I didn't like that message. And they're like, man, you get a one. You're not being a doer of the word at all. You're not responding. In fact, I, I will often ask people when people say, I loved your message, I'll say, hey, what did you like about it? And I'm not digging for a compliment. I'm actually interested in how did it challenge you to change? And the biggest compliments I ever get in regards to preaching is when people say, hey, this was in the message and I heard this through God's word and it made me do this. And oftentimes I've also heard people say that was a fantastic message and I wonder, that's great, appreciate it, I love words of affirmation, but did it cause any transformation in your life? And we can be deceived because we can go and hear a sermon every week, we can even get in the Bible once a week, I don't think that's a healthy diet, by the way, just once a week. It's not a good diet. But I think we can do that and just equate time listening to sermons and time in the world of transformation, and it doesn't necessarily mean it's the case. We can be deceived because God is asking us to be doers of the word. Doers of the word. So if we left today or any other week and we're leaving what would the angels give us our scorecards? Would we get a 10 from being doers of the word or would they be like, hey, you know, all talk, no show, man. Not doing anything with that. So it also talks about the word of God being like a mirror. Now this always confused me for years. I always thought this was a strange illustration. I'm like, I, I, don't, I, kind, I kind of don't get it, God. I would wrestle with this. Like, what does it mean that, that the word of God is like a mirror? It says this, it says that the word of God is like a, a mirror. It's like someone who looks at their face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what they look like. Now, let me just get real vulnerable with you and describe to you what I looked like yesterday morning. I took a ton of NyQuil to knock myself out. I woke up and my nose may or may not have been running all night onto the pillow. My hair may or may not have been sticking up like a mohawk. And I came and I, I stumbled in, you know, I, my wife was like, how are you feeling? I was like, I can't talk, hold on. And I go look at myself in the mirror and I'm like, holy moly, I look like death warmed over. I look horrific, snot out of my nose, sticking up, stuff in my teeth, horrific. You guys would not want to see a picture of that. Some of you would like to see a picture of that. I'm not going to show you a picture of that. But I looked in the mirror and I'm like, oh my gosh. Now, here's what it's like. Imagine saying you have kind of snot in your beard, and it's, it's gross illustration, I know. Bear with me. Hey, we got the grenade. I'm just leaning into the whole thing this morning. Bear with me, all right? I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm like, imagine if I just walked away and went and got breakfast, and I'm sitting down at the table just like that. You'd be like, that's ridiculous. The reason you have the mirror is to deal with what's in your life. Boom. Mic drop moment. So I looked in there and I was like, let me get the soap out. Oh, yuck, gross, need a shower. This is disgusting. Let me comb my hair, get this stuff off my face. Uh, let me gargle with some salt water real quick. You take care of it. And here's the thing about the word of God. The word of God will show you what's really happening in your life. It's a reflection of true spiritual reality. Did you hear me? The word of God is a reflection that shows you true reality in your life. It reflects what's actually going on. If you read it with an open heart and an open mind and submit it to God, you can read it and allow his word to convict you, to transform you, and to mold you. See, the mirror of God's word shows you what's really happening in your life and what's really happening in the way he wants you to live. Did you catch that? And we're living in a culture right now, especially with progressive Christianity, that is starting to mold and shape the word of God to fit the cultural narrative. Because we live in a culture right now that is actively discipling the church on certain issues, actively discipling the church. And the church now is getting to the point where we no longer be nebulous on certain topics. Because the world now is going to force us to have to take a stand on some of these issues. And if you don't know the word of God, guess what can happen? You can be deceived. Listen, church, I, I have something. This is not in my notes. I believe, this is not in my notes. I am shocked and disturbed of what I see online sometimes. Meaning stuff that's posted that is obvious sin where Christians are defending it. Defending it. Christians are defending sin. 
I saw it happen this last week. Someone posted about the Grammys and what happened at the Grammys and the display of the satanic and the open, outright display of satanic stuff and being celebrated in culture. And listen, if you get to know me, I'm not an alarmist. If you get to know me, I rarely say things like this publicly. Truly, it's the truth. But I just think we're living in a time. I, I read a post where someone posted about it and a bunch of believers started defending what happened. And, and, and listen, man, I'm not a judgmental dude. But I just sat there as a believer in Christ, as a pastor, and I said, what in the world is happening? How are we getting to a place in our society, in our culture, where, where things that are obviously evil, things that are obviously sin are being touted as good? That, that actually concerns me because it says in the last days that people will say things that are evil are actually good and things that are good are evil, and we are living in those times, church. And if you don't know the word of God, guess what? The culture is doing a better job at discipling some believers than the church is. As a parent with of three kids, a 23-year-old, an 18-year-old, and a 12-year-old, you know what I've learned? The culture is doing a better job discipling our children than we are. That's why I'm so grateful for our student ministries here. They reach into real topics. They dive into really hard stuff. And yes, I feel some fire in my bones because of it, because as a pastor and a shepherd, one of my jobs is to protect the flock. And here's one thing, it's not just my job or the elder's job to protect the flock. You have personal responsibility. And if you're not getting into the word, and if you're not accepting the full counsel of God's word, you are putting yourself in a position where you can be set up to be deceived, and it is happening in mass right now in the church. And not on my watch. Not on my watch, church. So my encouragement, my exhortation to you is please get into the word of God. Allow it to challenge you. It will challenge you. Yes, I read some things by Jesus and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe you said that. That is so hard to accept, Lord. But you're Lord and I'm not. You're God and I'm simply a servant. So let your word be true. And every man be a liar. All right. Rabbit trail over. Where in the heck am I at? James 125. I'm going to have to cook the last couple pages. We're going to go very quickly because I just went into a little holy tangent. But whoever looks intently under the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, will be blessed and all they do. Let me just make a few points out of that since I need to move quickly. It says this, I love the word, looks intently. To me, when I think about what does it mean to look intently into the word of God, that's deep study. That's a deep dive. And one beautiful thing about the modern times we live in is there are more resources available to us than there historically has been for 2,000 years. Uh, just a few tools that I personally like. There's a lot of people here who have the ESV study Bible, and that is a phenomenal tool if you want to dive deeper into God's Word. I, I personally love the, the NIV Life Application Bible. A lot of the notes are so practical. Those are two very practical tools. If you don't have a study Bible, I want to encourage you to get a study Bible. It will allow you to see the context and the background and really dive much deeper into God's Word. And, and here's the thing. It says, looks intently into the perfect law and continues in it. Do you have a habit of being in God's word? Do you have a daily habit of being in God's word? Listen, if, if I could teach the church to do anything, it would be this. Spend time with God every single day. Every single day, whether it's for five minutes or for an hour and an hour and a half, spend time with God. That will be the thing that moves the needle of your Christian maturity more than anything. Do you have a plan? If you don't, there's the YouVersion app. Everybody know what the YouVersion is? If you go to the app store and type in YouVersion, every single day they have a simple devotional. And, and I, I actually started using these a little bit last week, kind of as a supplement thing. I was just curious to what they had, and I found them to actually be pretty doggone good. And it's better than nothing. It takes about five minutes to go through, and if you don't have a plan at all and you're not getting consistently in the Word of God, that is a really easy place to start. But for a lot of y'all, I want to challenge you. Man, set aside 30 minutes in the morning. Set your alarm clock earlier to get up, to get with God, to seek him in prayer, to allow the word of God to take root in your lives. Get a habit of being in his word. 
But why would we do that? Why would we set up our lives in such a way where we're disciplined? Disciplined, there's an intentionality to looking intently. There's an intentionality to continuing in it. Why would we do that? Because he says this, it's the perfect law that gives freedom, that brings liberty. Listen, what did Jesus say? You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Get in God's truth and watch what he does. See, as I, as, I, as I challenge you, there has to be a motivator. What's the motivator for you to discipline your life to get into God's word? I would say this. Jesus wants to set you free. Jesus wants to set you free from the things that bind you up. Jesus wants to set you free from that mouth that gets you in trouble, the anger that throws the grenades. Jesus wants to mature you and set you free. His word is the law of liberty. We are under the law of freedom. We are not under the Old Testament law, a law of bondage, a law that does not allow us to experience God's grace. We are under the law of God's grace and transformation and his truth will set us free. Jesus did not come for us to live in a life of boring rules and regulations. He has come for us to know the truth, that we may have life, have it in abundance, and that we may experience the freedom that he purchased for us on the cross at Calvary. He wants us to actually experience it. Let me land this plane. James 1, 26 and 27, talking about pure religion. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Again, they deceive themselves. Second time that's mentioned. And their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. See, James shows us this. He says pure religion isn't just hearing the word. It's actually doing the word. And one way, one way we can do that is to bridle our tongue. We're to keep a tight ring on our tongue. And you'll see in the book of James, the mouth and the power of words and the tongue is a topic that he addresses again and again. He talks about the power of the tongue being like a bit, a bridle in a horse's mouth that can turn a powerful animal. And Jesus says, if you want pure religion, if you want true religion, learn how to reign in your words. I think no matter where we're at, all of us could use more self-control in the area of our, of our words and our tongue. There's a series I did last year, if you want to go back and listen to it. I thought it was a good series. I'm biased, of course, called The Power of Words. But we leaned into that about how powerful our words can be. And then he says there's a religion that has no deceit. And it's this, it's religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself being polluted by the world. I want to call up the worship band. See, back in the first century, the orphans and widows had no means of financial support. They were either going to have to beg, sell themselves into slavery, or starve. There was no systems of government to set up to help care for them. And here's a principle we can take away from that. Truly, we are called to keep, take care of the orphans and widows, but I think the overarching principle is this, is that God has called us to take care of powerless people. See, pure religion and pure love expressed in action takes care of the most vulnerable and the most powerless among us. And that was happening in the first century. In fact, the early church got a reputation for caring for those that the Roman world would discard and marginalize. Christians got a reputation of taking care of babies that were left on doorsteps. The Christians got a reputation of caring for lepers and those that society had rejected. And one reason that we, we do the food boxes every Tuesday with Caring Ministries is because it's a practical demonstration of taking care of those that sometimes can't take care of themselves. A few weeks ago, I shared this before, it's worth repeating again, a lady came up to me, really sweet, sweet lady, and said, are you the pastor? I said, yes, I am. She said, I want you to know, and she described her employment situation, she described how much money she makes, and she said, at the end of the month, I have about $100 left over for my kids and myself, and, and that includes us getting our necessities, and these food boxes are actually providing necessities for my family. They're actually feeding our family. And it just made me think of that verse, that religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is to look after the orphans and the widows. Lastly, it says to keep oneself from being polluted 
by the world. As I end today, I want to remind us that God has called us to be in the world, to be representatives of Christ in this world. Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed to the world because we're in the world. It says in John 5, 15, 9, is Jesus tells us that we are not of this world. Philippians reminds us that our citizenship is found in heaven, but yet we are residents on this planet. See, do we let the world set the thermostats of our life? Or do we let the fire of our walk with Christ set the thermostat in the world around us? Do we use our lives as an influence to shine the light of God's truth on others? Or is the world actually setting the temperature of our own life where we're lukewarm or maybe even cold in our faith? Because we're to take the truth of Christ. We're to take the word that's planted in us by being a doer. We're to live in God's freedom. We're to watch our words. We're to be quick to listen. We're to be slow to speak. We're to be slow to get angry. We're to look after the powerless with the compassion of Christ. And as we do that, we're not to be defiled of the world. We are to influence and be the lighthouse of the world that he's called us to be. I'm gonna lead us in a time of communion. If you don't have elements, you can raise your hand. I'm gonna ask for a few people to get up and grab the plates. If, if you don't have elements right now, can you lift up your hand really quickly and we'll do our best to get those to you. David, do you mind grabbing a tray? We're gonna start with the bread. You can rip open the... The act of communion is for those of us who are followers of Jesus. I'm gonna just respectfully ask if you're not yet chosen to follow Christ, just no pressure, no one's looking at you, there's no judgment, just to refrain due to honoring what the scriptures asked us to do. Every time I look at this little piece of bread, it reminds me, I have this mental picture of the movie, The Passion of Christ. If you've ever seen it, it's incredibly hard to watch. Jesus, at the end of that, before he's crucified, looked horrific. And we don't know exactly what that looked like, but we know that Christ on his body took the most unjust punishment and suffering and torture. He didn't deserve it. He was innocent. He was totally undefiled by the world. He was holy. But you know why he allowed himself to be subjected to that? Because he loved, he loved you so much. He, he so much wanted to purchase with his blood and free a people that he could call his own, that could become sons and daughters of the Most High, and it cost him the most costly of prices that in his innocence, he took this unjust suffering. His body was literally broken, whipped, tortured, nails driven into his hands and feet, his side pierced with a spear. And he allowed that to happen. He could have called down a legion of angels to annihilate his enemies, but he allowed himself to lean into that because of his absolute love for you. So this walk and this life we've been given in Christ does not come without a cost. It comes at a great cost to Jesus, but it's offered freely to us. So would you take with me the bread this morning that represents the broken body of Jesus? And as he hung there and the blood poured out from the cross, his mother stood there watching it, crying, in distress, his disciples were just totally overwhelmed. This was not what the Messiah was supposed to do. The Messiah was supposed to be a conquering king, not, a, not someone who was dying on a cross, being tortured. It's not what the, their idea of a Messiah was supposed to be. But there he hung, and his blood was literally poured out on the ground, poured out on the cross. And it's that blood that purchases a new covenant for us that we get to receive redemption and forgiveness and grace and mercy. We get to experience the Holy Spirit residing in us, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Christ did on the cross. So would you take with me in honoring, remembering the blood of Christ? Lord, we honor your body today. Would you help us in any area we're struggling today? Would you help us with our words? Would you help us not to be quick 
to get angry and quick to speak. Lord, would you allow your word to take a deeper root in our lives? Would you help us, God, not to be deceived, but to actually walk out your word and allow your word to transform us, God? Would you allow us to remember those who are powerless and weak among us? We look to you, Lord. We look to you for our sufficiency. We ask that you would do a mighty work in our life by the power of your own Holy Spirit. We ask this in the powerful and the mighty name of Jesus. Everyone said, and would you stand with us as we enter the worship today? Sad. 